Well, <laughs> good uh, afternoon over here in the UK. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, if you can see us up here live, uh, we have a very exciting series of uh, talks to do in this um, <laughs> Uh, for this uh, kind of stretch of our live stream. So thanks to everybody for joining us. So up first is uh, is our guest, Darren Nash, Dr. Darren Nash, uh, who is a, sorry, uh, who is a uh, paleontologist, consultant, and author. And um, he has written numerous books, consulted on many uh, popular media projects, and uh, is specializes in Mesozoic dinosaurs and pterosaurs, but you have very broad interests, isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, and you also uh, are well known for the blog um, Tetrapod Zoology, uh, which is a very long running and uh, widely read blog, at least in our community. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, in addition to dinosaurs and pterosaurs, you've also written papers on uh, giraffes and cassowaries and which are dinosaurs but not metazoic ones and uh lynxes even pipe fishes i know fish are your favorite <laughs> <laughs> so uh mm. tell us uh, what have you been up to recently well, what are some projects you might have released or uh, have been working on that you can tell us about yeah uh well thanks very much for the uh, introduction albert and thank you for having me as part of this uh blm live stream i've been watching been, <laughs> been watching things as they've been happening um this morning and uh, yesterday and ah oh, great stuff good work good work guys and i'm glad the fundraising is uh, is going well um well so the technical research i do um which should, i should emphasize that as a as a freelancer as someone who makes a living from you know writing and consultancy and so on any technical research i do is snatched in spare time you know just on here and there um, on weekends and in evenings if I'm not too tired, which means that anything, any technical work takes takes forever. And it's, uh, so I'm going off on a tangent here, but it's uh, it's very painful to me to see t colleagues churn out like a paper a week, sometimes two or three papers a week when, you know, I'm lucky if I can do one a year, but uh, that's, that's what it feels like anyway. Um, I've currently got two main areas of active technical um research going on one concerns the early cretaceous theropod dinosaurs of uh, southern england part of that is work that stems from my phd which i finished way back in about 2006 but still haven't published it because you know not having been employed in academia i just haven't had the you know the, the apart from, i did have one stint as a as a as a postdoc researcher but that's like a mm -hmm. as a long backstory and an interesting story there which i won't go into today um so yeah, bunch and a bunch of bunch of old stuff I need to publish, and I still haven't done it, including the Eotyrannus monograph, various redescriptions of historical specimens, and loads of new stuff that's coming over the past couple of years. And um, right now, myself and Neil Gosling and Chris Barker, who are paleontologists both here in Southern England, um, they uh, w I've been working with them on some new. Uh, species. So we're still finding new species of theropods in the lower Cretaceous rocks of southern England. Uh, if it appeared inconsistent there, because I said early Cretaceous at one point and lower Cretaceous at another, mm. early and late, I'm saying this for the benefit of the few listeners who don't know this, early and late refers to the periods of time. So if you were Tyrannosaurus, you lived in the late Cretaceous. But when you're talking about the rocks, Tyrannosaurus comes from upper Cretaceous rocks. And it means there's this annoying inconsistency as goes which system we use. And I, ha I have to use both, depending on the context. So we're still finding in lower Cretaceous rocks, we're still finding new dinosaurs in southern england which is just ridiculous mm -hmm. given given that southern england is like the best explored bit on the face of the planet probably um so there's that there's some really really cool stuff that's gonna gonna create quite a splash when it is published which i just can't talk about it's too sensitive mm. uh but i will cryptically say that it's relevant to some other things that have created quite a splash in the world of uh uh the dinosaur publications on mesozoic dinosaurs and I'm sure you know what i'm getting out there <laughs> it's dinosaurs <laughs> um secondly secondly i also um i'm involved in a bunch of things on as dark pterosaur diversity and paleobiology um 
there was um together with liz martin silverstone mark witten and others i've published some things on um you know what we think about the way of life of as darkoid pterosaurs uh liz and myself published a paper a couple of years ago where we used um spinal nerve size in some as dark or pterosaurs to see and, and some other groups of pterosaurs as well to see if that could inform us on lifestyle and liz myself and mark we are putting the fine the, the finishing touches right now to a paper on the flight behavior of juvenile uh, as dark or pterosaurs which uh, is a uh, really cool research something we've just been you know had in, uh, going on in the background for for a while so so those are my two main technical uh, research areas and, and like i say coming together very very slowly but mm. Yeah. Well, exciting. I think so. <laughs> um, it, f- it feels to me like, you know, if you only publish one or two papers a year, mm-hmm. and, I, and I guess, you know, this is an interesting thing in academia. We often tend to, uh, we can't help but compare ourselves to hyperproductive colleagues, mm-hmm. you know, unusually productive colleagues who, for whatever reason, and I don't mean any ill will towards those people, but for whatever reason, they're in a very fortunate position Mm -hmm. due to funding, due to the shape of their own lives, where they are in their careers, you know, where they are geographically, politically, uh, for all kinds of reasons, you know, you're you're talking about people that can spend 24-7, 365 churning out a paper a week. (laughs) And and you shouldn't, yeah, you shouldn't (laughs) compare yourself to those people. Because if you, you know, it's more ordinary to, I would say as a busy academic, as, as, as a person who's, you know, involved in a bunch of connected things mm-hmm. and is, you know, trying to publish papers out while at the same time doing whatever it is you, you do to earn money and live as a human, then I think you should be talking about, what do you reckon, Albert? I would say, I would say, th- you know, three, four papers a year is like more like about what you kind of air quotes should expect. I mean, that sounds like a reasonable, yeah, amount to, to have considering everything else. <laughs> yes, I would agree. Yeah, yeah. So, so if I publish, you know, now in summer 2020, you know, the last paper I published was, uh, uh was probably about March this year. That mm-hmm. was the paper with. Carrie Woodruff and Jamie Dunning on um, whether extinct um, archosaurs might have used UV light in visual displays, right. which uh, was a really interesting kind of th- thought experiment. And I've come out of the, uh, the, the, the for those of you who are not familiar with it, the easiest like summary is, is go to my Touchbot Zoology article. <laughs> did did uh, dinosaurs and pterosaurs glow? Um, and uh, the basic conclusion, having, you know, gone through it and come out the other side is no they didn't <laughs> they, they um even if they even if um some of their tissues did uh fluoresce um then the animals like they wouldn't have fluoresced enough for the animals to see it it probably wouldn't have made any difference to mm. visual displays and whatnot and um it was it was just an interesting thing i think to explore someone had to do it at some point right Excellent. Yeah, uh, that was a that was a very interesting paper. I certainly remember it quite well, and as well as your blog post about it. Um, yeah, but uh, in addition to papers, you also uh, work on books as well, both as consultant and as author. Um, so, have you uh, you know been working on or uh, finished any book projects recently? Yeah. Um... I am always putting together books in the background. I think that is my life these right. days. So um, anyone who's familiar with my my stuff and follows me on social media will know that for something terrifying, like five or six years, I've been trying to put together a textbook. on. It's called The Vertebrate Fossil Record, and uh, it is a review of all of the fossil vertebrates. So group go through each group, group by group by group, and uh, just basically talk about you know what we know and what people have said about uh, the distribution of species in genera you know what we know what we understand about the pattern of evolution in the group and um you know key features of the groups what makes them you know anatomically interesting or whatever what we know about their ecology biology behavior for some groups my favorite random example is jelly nose fishes you know for Mm. jelly nose fishes we've you could you could probably say like only 500 words it's like what are jelly nose fishes they're this weird group of deep sea fishes with like weird soft jelly like noses and 
got some vague idea of where they fit in the fish family tree it's funny that i've just started off with a group of fish isn't it Um, (laughs) (laughs) and then what do we know about their fossil record well thanks to should i should i even mention otoliths or should i just not even bother so okay i just just another tangent here well feel free to go hey we have time (laughs) (laughs) if um Okay, if you're interested in the uh, Actinopterygian fishes, that's the ray-finned bony fishes, then they've got these tiny little um, scale-like ear bones called otoliths. And otoliths are basically indestructible. And in a single, like, handful of sediment, so, like, imagine you just scoop up a handful of sand or mud from the seafloor or from the lake, lake floor or something, In that single handful, Mm -hmm. you could have a thousand otoliths, and otoliths are diagnosable to species level. Mm -hmm. They're distinctive for every single group of Actinopterygian fishes, and being so tiny and so common, they are essentially indestructible. They can, you know, kick around in sediment for tens of millions of years and still preserve their key features. Mm -hmm. So there's loads and loads of groups of Actinopterygian fishes where we have uh, 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 at best a handful of actual good fossils as in like you know semi-complete or complete skeletons or we have none we have no complete skeletons or no partial skeletons but we still have otoliths Mm. so you can have otoliths of some of these groups that go all the way back to the mesozoic to most typically to the late cretaceous which Mm. is when this radiation of vertebrate animals the most important radiation of vertebrate (laughs) animals they took (laughs) off um but we you know we only have otoliths to 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 go on so um if you want to well want to is too strong a term if you if you have to (laughs) review the fish fossil record you need to get deep in the otolith literature and um oh and otoliths also they record the life history of individuals they've got growth rings you can work out from the isotopes they contain what the animals ate so they're of great interest to Mm. fisheries biologists and uh, you know statistical ecologists and all kinds of people like that so um uh why on earth am i talking about otoliths <laughs> they um, sound a bit like fish yeah. pollen <laughs> like yeah 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 they are they totally are the <laughs> fish pollen grains so right. fish are yeah so even even when the uh age of humans is done and there's no like large animals left you know we've killed everything destroyed the planet then people that are you know going through the fossil record and they're not they're not able to find you know good fossils of actinopterygian fishes they'll they'll think wow they were just billions and billions and billions of tons of these animals based on the number (laughs) of of otoliths you you, you'd be able to work that out just from otoliths alone so um yeah so so that textbook project the vertebrate fossil record is constantly being added to over time and there's still years left before it's done literally years left if i could devote all my time to it i could probably get it done in like probably a year right because the bulk of it is now done again massive air quotes here (laughs) only have to finish the reptile chapter the mammals and the stem mammals so non-mammalian synapses that's got to be finished and everything else is just air quotes Mm. again just updating because obviously that's all harking back to what said a moment ago about people publishing people just <laughs> will not stop publishing as like, as like hundreds imagine like we all we all struggle you albert you'll struggle to keep up with the neonathine bird literature yes, now exactly. there's so so much of it obviously if you're doing all of the vertebrates oh my god I, yeah i cannot even imagine trying yeah oh, so all i do is just bookmark add add, add papers to my a huge bookmarks you know less than it's oh god it's terrifying so there's that there's the, the vertebrate fossil record in the background right. as um as always eventually i'll be finished with it um i still am in the habit of promoting some of my other recent books mm-hmm. which uh dinosaurs how they lived and evolved yeah. co-authored excellent. with paul barrett excellent yeah book. thank you very much i'm, I'm still always talking about that because that feels new and that also is a um it's a book that its its predecessor, um, Gardam and Milner's The Natural History Museum Book of Dinosaurs, mm. and the predecessor, predecessor to that, Alan Charig's a, a New Look at the Dinosaurs, they were both in print for over 10 years, and they kept on you know, updating them. Um, that's the plan with this book, that it's the main Natural History Museum dinosaur book, 
published obviously here in, in London in the, in the UK, the Natural History Museum in London. So th- we're going to be up- updating that, you know, every couple of years. And, and obviously there's always new stuff to, to be added. Um, I'm also still thinking of this as a relatively new book, oh, Evolution yeah. in Minutes, yep. nice which is book. a, thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I haven't really spoken enough about this book and I haven't done signings for it or anything, but I really should. And um, I'm, I'm really pleased with some of the feedback that I've, I've gotten off it. So yeah. thanks to those who've said nice things about it. But then the the main project at the moment is a, um, I won't give away all the details, but it's a popular encyclopedia of dinosaurs. Um, and when I say popular, I mean it will mostly focus. There are already some, you know, big encyclopedias of knowledge on dinosaurs don glutes gigantic books and the curry and padian mm. um academic press one and um, this is more of a like uh a, a kind of like a, a book that focuses on the the popular side of dinosaur research so those of us who are interested in dinosaurs in pop culture dinosaurs in art um the um, the ideas that have appeared in the popular fringe and grey literature, so the kind of stuff, and I don't mean any disrespect by this whatsoever, but the kind of stuff that's been promoted by people like Bob Backer and Greg Paul, those those the, those guys, um, it's it's kind of based around discussing that more than the more uh, technical stuff, mm-hmm. if that kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. And and I, I think it's working and it's coming together. I've, I've, I've passed the halfway mark. Okay. But, uh, but again, it's a thing happening, you know, ticking away in the in the background, that book. Right. Uh, and is that it? Um, well, I, I, I mean, I, I well, just I, I could just <laughs> I could. Well, I could go on and on. You have to you have to interject and stop me. Cause, uh, right, right. Well, um, I, I will remind our listeners or slash viewers that uh, if you send in donations and ask if you want to ask questions to Darren, uh, you can send in donations to do that. Uh, and if you send in questions without a donation, we can still try to answer them, but they will be considered a lower priority than the ones that come with donations. So uh, get your donations in and uh, get your questions answered within this hour that we have. All right. Cool. Yeah, no, there's, there's other stuff I can talk about if you want me to. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there's so I've also been putting together a coloring book in, and I've just oh, been right. yeah. so... I find it quite therapeutic, like, you know, we often spend, probably those of us involved in writing and academia, Mm -hmm. spend way too much time sat in front of computers, and you you mustn't spend, like, all of your time writing and reading on computers, you've got to do some other stuff, I mean, I try and get out into the the green parts of the world as much as possible, relatively lucky to be close to some pretty good ones. But I also like drawing. I find drawing is very uh, therapeutic and, um, you know, a good thing to do. Yeah. So not only am I always drawing animals for my own projects, but also quite like constructing landscapes. Mm. So uh, I don't have any examples to hand. And I, I suppose, I don't know, well, I suppose I could share some on the share screen oh, function. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I've been um, producing some complex uh, scenes, which I imagine um, forming part of a... Um, um, like a, a, basically a coloring book. Hey, you know what? You know what I'm going to do? Yeah. I am going to like open some of the illustrations that I've been compositing for the big book. Sounds excellent. That's just because I've, I've seen in the live stream already, Joshua and the others, they've, they've <laughs> been, they've been doing all kinds of crazy animal they, pictures. So. They've been busy with the art. Yes. Yeah. Oh, mo- most of my stuff I've, I've deliberately saved low res versions so um which sure. which isn't which isn't going to work but let's start with oh sorry bear with me here there you go uh, i thought everyone would like to see that that's a, a great classic uh, piece of artwork that i did <laughs> when <laughs> can you see we that we haven't seen it on the screen yet no. oh that's uh, weird um sorry how about now uh, terrace yeah, pterosaur yeah. attack Oh yeah! <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> that is lovely. That's yeah. something I did as a kid. Right. Uh, it it obviously shows uh, you know a megalosaur, uh-huh. which which as everyone knows evolved in the Triassic and existed all the way to the end of the Cretaceous. <laughs> right. That's a massive joke. They totally didn't, but that's what people kind of thought you know decades ago. Right. And of course you've got to be attacking Pteranodon because that's the that's the pterosaur that lives 
<laughs> in the desert where there are cycads and stuff, as you can see. Um, this uh, it's a it's a picture I probably did when I was about twelve, and um, uh, it's not original at all. It's just it totally copies the mm. composition that features in uh, a book by a guy called Michelle Gilbert called mm. The Dinosaurs Discovered. Because um, a lot of my early illustrations are just totally copied from other people's work, which I think is pretty normal, actually. I think it's pretty typical, yes. Uh, yeah. I can attest to that. That is how you start being, you know, learning how to draw uh, things. Right. Okay, so can you see the pterosaur montage? Yes, I can. So for the big book... Um, I really like montages in books where they show like the, the the range of diversity that you have within a group. So for all the groups of vertebrates, um, I've done this kind of thing. This this by the way, this is totally provisional. This is just literally thrown together. This is not going to be the final composition, mm -hmm. and it doesn't feature all the animals. And furthermore, a lot of the animals here need uh, modification in ideas coming in on you know aspects of anatomy so right. uh, there's stuff here that needs to be changed in to do with the Europatagium. those of you who know anything about pterosaurs the mm -hmm. membrane in the back of the legs um but yeah I've, I've just done a million of those and that's one i'm prepared to share i'm going to stop sharing now All right. um, yeah. um so are, are these montages going to going to be to scale because that's probably going to be uh, uh, quite difficult for some some groups i would imagine where the size disparity can be quite quite huge uh, a, a, a good point and a major source of discussion mm -hmm. um, and um, so for squamates lizards and snakes I initially did everything to scale so you had like gigantic pythons and really big monitor lizards right. which are you know certainly over certainly over five meters long and in cases you know twice that long in case that's in case the bigger snakes and yeah the other side end of the scale you got animals that are you know shorter than the length of your finger and put them all in a montage and exactly what you would expect right. happened. happened. You have like these gigantic lizards and snakes at the top of the screen. And, um, oh, we're still sharing. Oh, right, yes. yes Are sorry. we? Stop sharing. Is that yeah. gone now? Yeah, yeah sorry. Okay. Luckily, nothing weird on my screen right now. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and so the, the, the outcome has to be... Um, um, yeah, no, do different montages for different right. sized animals. Sense, yeah. yeah, which is what I'm going to have to do. Um, I was going to also mention, um, well, there's, so there's, so that's, book, okay, book type stuff. There's another, there's one more book worth, book type thing that's oh, worth yeah. saying. And that is uh, yeah. all yesterday's. Yes. Is very well known by this point. Yeah, 2012 book by myself, John Conway, Memo Kozman, contributions by Scott Hartman. Scott was uh, featured in this um, live stream yesterday, I believe. Yes, he I, was. I, yeah, I saw I saw a little bit of it, and um, um, we are planning. And there's like lots of caveats attached to that term right. but we are planning to produce a 10 year um what do you call it like i don't want to say celebratory that sounds too grandiose but a, a sort of 10 year like update version of all yesterday's uh for 2022 which is not long away mm. is it so um not exactly yeah yeah and I, I don't know whether that can work because I think I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to say this. Right. John John Conway and Memo Kozman are s total slackers. <laughs> They're like <laughs> especially especially Conway. He's the laziest person I know. <laughs> it's like years and years go by and no progress on anything. So we're supposed to have done the second book of our cryptozoological series a cryptozoology series of books yeah, we're supposed good. to have done that i don't i don't i don't even know 10 years ago eight years ago five <laughs> years ago i don't know and like they have just not done anything on it whatsoever and so whether whether an all yesterday's update will actually work out i don't know I, it probably won't but you know i'm, I'm hoping for it so uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find out i suppose <laughs> 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 when 2022 sales passed with no uh, no fanfare whatsoever, you'll know. Yeah, you'll know what's happened. Um, 
uh, and I'd, I'm not I'm not being mean to them. And 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 Memo Memo actually does actually work quite hard. He's right. got all, all kinds of like unusual projects. Um, in in part, I mean, he does loads of stuff. Not only his his amazing artwork, but he does loads of things to do with cultural anthropology mm. of of Turkey. He's he's done whole books on um, uh, you know, like um. Um, Muslim graveyards and Turkish architecture and loads of stuff. So, so he's he's always busy with stuff. Right. But John Conway, on the other hand, such a slacker. <laughs> well, out of the um, out of the books that you have uh, worked on, uh, which one would be your favorite? Do you think, like either either to work on or the one you're most pleased with the final product? That's an excellent question. And there's. Um, I would say there's like four or five that I do feel quite uh, quite proud of. Mm. Um, the so dinosaurs how they lived and evolved right. with Paul Barrett. Pretty right. happy so, with that. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Um, I'm especially keen on the great dinosaur discoveries. Uh, yes, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. This was published in 2009 yeah. by A and C Black in the UK. And it was published in the U.S. by California University Press, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yep, no, University of California Press. Yeah, and totally different cover. Right. That's what which, I have. <laughs> right, it's 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 nice, but I prefer the Sargon yeah. one. I think yeah. I think it's better. Right. Um, and yeah, I, I I quite like this book. It's a it's a kind of guide to. I, I can't hold it in front of the camera. <laughs> yeah. Um. My take on human knowledge is that you should think of any like area of our knowledge mm -hmm. as like a castle made of Lego. And that ordinarily in their careers, scientists get to add like one or two bricks mm -hmm. to, to the, the Lego castle. And it's very rare for one person or a group of people to actually demolish a wall and rebuild it in a different right. form. Right. And so if you think of, so think of like our knowledge of dinosaurs is something that with tiny, tiny accruings of like addition of little extra Lego bricks right. and occasional people coming along, you know, the odd thing like Ostrom and Backer, obviously yeah. late sixties. Yeah. The occasional thing where someone does get to actually change the shape of part of the castle and, might be a bit of a weird analogy but i think if you're going to talk about the history of a given subject and in, in this particular case the history of how we've built our knowledge of dinosaurs over time it's that it's like you know ex researcher x did this this tiny little addition and then that allowed this person to build that on top of it and that allowed this person to build on top of it and then this new discovery was made yada yada so that's the book is the book is designed to explain that how um tiny uh, accruings of information have like built our built our knowledge and like so you know this group of researchers could only say this about horned dinosaurs mm -hmm. because previously this person had done that and right. so you've got to like right. go go through it that way so it goes through the whole subject um in a chronological uh, basis and um obviously it's very well illustrated yes. i believe it's out of print uh, so um <laughs> Yeah, and uh, a, th a thing that I've said a few times and bears repeating now, I don't know how familiar this is, but as an author, you often hear like almost nothing about like what people think about your your own your work. Mm -hmm. So in the modern age, I think authors are more inclined to hear about their work thanks to Amazon in particular. Right. Um, you get a fair selection. You get, you get, hopefully, if your book is like half decent, you'll get three quarters of people saying, "Yeah, it's all right, it's pretty good. I quite liked it. My kids liked it." And then you'll get the remaining, um, you know, uh, percentage saying, "I wish you would die." And this book is the worst thing I've <laughs> ever spent money on. And why can't this person write? You know, you get, you get that as well. Yeah, but um, right. yeah, you. you you do by and large hear more than I think you did, but in terms of like substantive response, right. you know, actual the sort of the lengthy responses you that you crave that you want as a as an author in in the lifespan of a book, you know, while it's available and visible, you might get like seriously four or five right. bits of feedback. And I feel for the great dinosaur discoveries, that's what I got. There's a, there's a couple of like quite nice art articles. Uh, Riley Black did a really 
good thing mm -hmm. on a blog. Um, there's one or two reviews that are published in like um, uh, BBC Wildlife magazine yeah. and New Scientist, and then that's that's it. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so if you ever buy a book and like it or think highly of it, don't hesitate to somehow communicate that to the author because right. that can not just make their day but literally make their career yeah. <laughs> so uh, right so uh, well you, you guys heard darren so if you like a book please review it somewhere public so the authors can find out and other people can find out about it um excellent yeah and uh, please do keep your donations and questions coming um but in the meantime i guess uh, that does remind me that you do relatively frequently write uh, reviews of other people's books in uh, often technical journals or sometimes on your blog as well. Uh, so is that partially motivated by the fact that you know what it's like to not receive substantive feedback? Um, uh, the 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 good and honourable answer would be to say yes, right. yes. But the actual truth is, <laughs> this is how you get books. This is how you you get. <laughs> Okay, so I like books. I have a lot of books and there's always new books coming out that I want. And I realized some years ago as a, you know, as a PhD student, it's like, wait a minute, you can write, you can, you can offer to write about books and they send them to you for free. <laughs> so there are books I own, which like, there's no way I would ever, even if I could afford them, there's no way I would buy them because they are prohibitively expensive as in hundreds of of dollars yeah, or pounds yeah. euros well. hundreds of yeah literally hundreds of pounds and um and to my surprise one to my, to, that's not quite accurate not quite accurate i have discovered that publishers by and large are more than happy to send them to you on the condition that you write you know that you write a review and um i quite like writing reviews i think that and I, you know i really hope this doesn't sound arrogant but i think that if you've if you're relatively well read across the relevant area, mm -hmm. like so, I might be a sort of someone who publishes on dinosaurs, but I know enough about turtles or mammals or God help me, even fishes, mm -hmm. to you know, to be able to say relevant things um, about uh, those books and 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 thereby yeah can can do them justice and um, and that and I feel, I feel that's important because um, right. again this might sound weird and arrogant and I apologise if it does, but um, nothing like hurts more than seeing uh, someone write a review when they clearly don't know the first thing mm -hmm. about the subject it's like right you, you, what how, how what gave you what gives you, how do you have the expertise to like have a, a useful take on someone else's work mm -hmm. and i've got a really uh what a, a favorite anecdote here there's some friends of mine who um cottoned on years ago that they could also get big expensive books uh, in this way right. and um there's a team of researchers and one of them really likes butterflies and uh he, <laughs> he obtained this book called the butterflies of new guinea and it's like it's it's i don't know it's like wow. 10 to 15 <laughs> centimeters thick it's like 600 dollars and um the review read as follows do you like butterflies do you like new guinea if the answer to both of these questions is yes then this is the book for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And um, it was like, well, okay, you can, so that's, that's how helpful. you, that's how you get a book. <laughs> um, but, um, as you'll know from Tech Podsology, my, my reviews tend to be a little bit more nuanced, mm -hmm, yeah. slight, slightly more, slightly more depth than that. <laughs> but um, but maybe good. they don't have, maybe they don't have to be, <laughs> maybe that could work. Do you like, do you like fossils? Do you like mammals? Well, then, Evolution of Tertiary Mammals in North America, Volume 2. That's for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> lots of uh, interesting things to chew on there about uh, what you yes. should, should do in reviews, <laughs> or shouldn't. <laughs> mm, so, mm. let's see. Yeah, we have talked about research papers. We've talked about books and book reviews. Um how about blogging? Because obviously, as I mentioned, your blog is quite well known and a long running blog uh, in the paleo slash zoology community. Uh, it's called Tetrapod Zoology, so it covers quite a broad scope. I mean, most recently you blogged about shrews, I believe, right? Yeah. 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 Group of yeah. Animals. yeah. Oh my God, they're amazing, aren't they? <laughs> um, do, do, do you have lots of hands on familiarity with shrews? I mean, are they a group of no, animals I, that you've. I, I've barely seen seen them in life, like 
not not many experiences with them. They they're not very commonly kept in captivity. Mm. Um, I haven't seen them too often in the wild. Maybe dead ones occasionally, but uh, yeah, I, I haven't really seen them in in living and doing their thing like in person. Yeah, so I see common shrews mm. many and hear them as well, like te- certainly tens of times in in the UK and mm. elsewhere in Europe. But um, yeah, so a weird tangent there, uh, shrews <laughs> no, on, right. my, on my mind at the moment. Yeah, I've got where's where's my current spate of uh, where's my shrew drawings? Oh, here you go. Let's let's say say some. Oh yeah, nice. done some shrews. I've got a whole bunch more that I need to do. Right. But um, um, blogging, blogging, it, um, blogging is um one of the most valuable things that I've ever done, mm-hmm. I would agree. and <laughs> and I think that it's um, it's a it's it's a weird thing. It's a bit like um, I, I okay, this is got, might sound strange. I can't help comparing it to the property market. So I live in a house and if I were to try and get a house today yeah. in the financial position that I'm in, it wouldn't be possible because there's no way I could like, you know, find the money to buy a house. But my wife and I um, managed to buy a property like years and years back, just in a certain point when the property market meant that we could do that and that right. got us on the property ladder right. that, was, that was a totally weird analogy i don't know if that made any sense but it's the same thing with blogging mm. i think i honestly think that blogging has had its like it's a sort of heyday. there was a it's had its heyday right. and that's passed right. and today social media is obviously you know about um, you know a, a list a list of other um venues available to us but when blogging went through scientific blogging went through like this big you know surge i was at the right time the right place to start blogging to become kind of like um you know become quite known and established Um, within a year of just randomly blogging just for fun i became part of the franchise the science blogs yes. thing which then was sold to scientific american being attached to scientific american is a big deal it's really good for you Definitely. turns out yeah it turns out they weren't at all interested in blogging and i think <laughs> they made a yeah. complete disaster of it which is why i eventually left right. and today i'm independent but um i think that i got like uh, a fair amount of um uh attention in the limelight which is yes. totally totally not the right term it's not what i need but use need but i want to use but i can't think of a better term mm. um sort of some some like you know kudos and recognition um and also became known to uh you know i got jobs because of it right sense of author authoring stuff editing stuff becoming known to publishing houses becoming known to certain media companies i've had loads of um um experience with um people in tv because of articles i've written Mm -hmm. because um they're you know findable enough and often they're the only things written online yeah but which is which feels to me a bit dirty given that um i think it's really important to and this is true of everything of it's, it's really important to credit where you've taken your ideas from don't just say, I've always said that Tyrannosaurus did this. It's like, well, as others have said before me, or right. as as was said by, you know, so-and-so, you know, this researcher and that researcher beforehand, right. um, I, I hope it's obvious that I, that I do that. And so for me to kind of get credit as the person who wrote about the predatory behavior of the pallid long-eared bat it's like well what i did is i read what other people have said about it and summarized it in a venue that's more easily findable to someone using google for two minutes yeah Yeah. so so it always feels a bit dirty to me that i've kind of got Mm. a lot of work that way but i have and um so today even today when I, i i'm i'm making a living as a as a consultant and editor and author combined um even today i i don't want to stop blogging even though it's not kind of essential to me Absolutely, um yeah. mm. still try and churn something out at least once every couple of weeks i mean i aim for i aim for four articles a month which is really stupid of me mm-hmm. but um that is what i do and um and i'm et- uh, eternally frustrated that i can't do more right. that um I, I i want to i want to cover more i want to you know cover more of the diversity of 
the tetrapods. Let's not talk about the other vertebrates. <laughs> <laughs> the um, non-tetrapod vertebrates. But, um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, no everything, uh, everything there makes a lot of sense. And de definitely, like, uh, a lot of the information that you blog about is locked up mostly in paywall technical journals or uh, in expensive books that are hard to hard to find uh, so definitely uh, I, I i can definitely believe that they are the most accessible source of information on a lot of these aspects i, I remember in um, watching them um, uh, i think it was planet earth 2 when they were showing the long-eared bat pallet long-eared bats hunting scorpions i was like hey i read about that in don tetsu and yeah <laughs> yeah it was um, yeah so you have we spoken about this before because i was that is very specific. The exact sequence they show is very clearly based I, on the blog article. Yeah, and, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't think I've heard from you on that specific um, aspect before. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that, uh, that that's, that's what happened. I'm just going to do an unusual thing. Okay. Uh, can, you, can you see my files here? Am I, I, have I shared screen? screen yeah. uh, so just for interest... Um, okay, this is the blogs file, and um, I, like, I, I don't think we've got I don't think we've got Tetrapod Zoology super fans here. But just to give you some idea of the amount of stuff that's still unfinished, this is this is mostly unfinished stuff. Some of you will wow. recognise, yeah, um, African horses, African toads, Aldrovandi monstrous rooster. Need to come back to that. All yesterday's reducts, amazing Tetrapods 2018, Amabella dontids, Amphiglossus, Amphispanian portraits, Angiac. Wanted to mama saw animals named from photos, anomalures. Oh my god, we're just still in A. Baulor, banned, birds are not dinosaurs. <laughs> right. Bath of the year, good mole rats, bats, battling tits or tit mice if you're American, if you must. Uh, let's skip <laughs> oh, over the gosh. Bigfoot article there. Um, uh, Bigfoot if real, bipedality in deer, bird watching in China, uh, Britain's toys, Brontosaurus, Buntings, Canolestias, Camelids. <laughs> um, this is. Yeah. Uh, I can, we're seeing, I yeah. can see how much of a backlog. Well, I, I know some of those have, have been published, right? But yeah, um, yeah. That, is, uh, that is just incredible, astonishing. Uh, it's staggering. Oh, wait. And, we, have, um, we, we actually have some questions from the audience. Whoa. Oh, all right. So um, let's see. Uh, the first one is from uh, Derek Den Uden. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Uh, could you, meaning Darren, Please elaborate on your ideas about the new possible Mosasaur egg. Oh, oh, well, well, that's not controversial. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting that the, okay, for, the, for those few people who don't know, and I expect most listeners do, um, how do you pronounce the name of the first author? Legendre? I, I don't know how to, to say it, but um, a, a team have just published on a uh, Maastrichtian, so very latest Cretaceous soft-shelled egg discovered in the um i discovered at the very latest cretaceous rocks of uh, antarctica it's a large egg like i don't know the centimeter you know size centimeters but they describe it as the size of like do they say a football presumably meaning an american football mm. so that's got to be like i don't know 25 centimeters along its longest axis and um that they, they they do pretty good analysis of its um you know um structure and whatnot and and what is it and they say in lacking a calcareous layer, I think that it's most likely a, um, they say in the paper that it's most likely a squamate egg. Right. So laid by a member of the snake lizard group. Of course, remember, snakes are actually a group of lizards. Mm. And, um, and, and yet it's from a clearly big, a, a very big animal. They, they have loads of like um, graphs showing like body size relative to egg size. Uh, relations and uh, they say this this animal must be like i don't know over six meters long is it lopez de berto dano formation i think is the actual yeah, geological so. unit yeah and there's mosasaurs there mosasaurs a group of giant swimming lizards from the cretaceous so they say could this be a mosasaur egg now immediately everyone is thinking well we know that mosasaurs were viviparous we know they gave birth to life babies mm. we've actually got um, fossils of mosasaur embryos and we've got members of the mosasaur lineage where you've actually got pregnant mothers with the babies inside them so um, it seems that they evolved viviparity life births quite early in their history actually they know all that of course but they're saying 
in spite of that, it's still possible that something could go wrong in um, development of mm. the baby, right. or maybe there could be weird species that did a weird thing. You know, as always with these groups of animals, we're talking about with we're never talking about like a, a handful of species that are around for a few thousand years. Mm. We're talking about tens of species that are around for tens of millions of years. So there's all kinds of scope for you know un- surprising, unexpected evolutionary things to happen so they're saying yeah they're saying could it be from a mosasaur but they also say that we're not committed to that idea and there's a couple of other things on the table and in the commentary piece that appears in the same issue of the journal Mm. um the same authors admit that it could actually be a dinosaur egg it could possibly be an egg from a giant pterosaur Mm. it could be a weird turtle egg Mm. now on the same day that that paper came out mark norell and colleagues they published their paper on um research this was research that was presented at svp in yeah. australia i think yeah, yeah? I think they so. right that and that paper shows that um this idea that all dinosaur eggs were hard shelled with a you know calcareous outer layer is not the case they say that at least some dinosaur groups not all but some dinosaur groups laid soft shelled eggs mm-hmm. And of course, some dinosaur eggs, and we know this from you know hundreds of specimens found on all continents. Some of them were really big, like the size of again, I, I I'm going to struggle to come yeah. up with an actual specific measurement. I'm yeah. going to say dia- diameters of like 15 to 17 centimeters, or maybe a bit bit, bit bigger, 15, that kind of size. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So most um, researchers who voiced an opinion have actually said that. Well, hold on. Now that we know that some dinosaurs produce soft shelled eggs. Some dinosaurs are very large, given how unlikely it is that it's a mosasaur egg. This probably is a dinosaur egg that mm-hmm. got into marine sediments. Right. That's my preferred opinion. Mm-hmm. And I would also say it's an outside bet that it could be an as dark as pterosaur mm-hmm. egg. Yeah. Now, for, for other reasons, um, uh, Mark Witten, who I've worked with on as dark a bunch of times, some of you will know, uh, he has actually recently for for, for secret reasons <laughs> has been working out the size of an as dark egg mm-hmm. and already his size estimate for an asdarkid egg is the, basically the same size wow. as this new antarctic specimen so yeah so could it be a dinosaur egg i think that's most likely mm-hmm. could also be a pterosaur egg mm-hmm. but it's an outside bet it could still be a weird like i don't know one-off weird mutant mosasaur egg or right. possibly a right. turtle egg there are t- sea turtles do lay hard-shelled eggs and some lay soft-shelled eggs right. so so yeah Okay, yeah, that sounds uh, sounds sounds good. I believe you should have uh, that should be a satisfying answer to that question. Uh, we have a second question uh, from Kaz, who is one of the organizers of this stream. Uh, you mentioned that some of your pterosaurs needed updating for the book, and I'm wondering how you draw the line where you have to stop updating them and leave <laughs> them be, even if new info comes out. That's always the dilemma, isn't it? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think at the moment I'm not close enough to the end to right. have decided that there's a cutoff point. So at some point there will have to be a cutoff. And I reckon the way things are going, one day in 2022, I'll say, right, that's it. No more updates. Right. Just going to have to ignore everything that comes in mm-hmm. from here. Uh, but until that point, I'm quite happy to continue updating or annoyingly, I have to, you know, totally redraw some organisms entirely. Yeah. Um, what I tend to do in those cases, if it's something relatively minor, as it is with the pterosaurs, with pterosaurs, it's just the shape of that membrane attaching the back of the legs to one another. Right. That's that's an easy fix, an easy digital fix. If it's like the whole animal turns out to be like the reconstruction is bogus because I went with some particular speculative model and got it completely wrong. Yeah. Well, in that case, and that's happened with some... Um, there's some like carboniferous um, cartilaginous fishes where the the original takes just like no they were they were smoking crack when they came up with that it looked totally different in that case show both reconstructions and say this is what people thought in 2015 Mm -hmm. this is what they now think in 2020 Mm -hmm. i think that's valuable yeah yeah for sure all right uh let's see are we getting any more questions i see someone typing (laughs) <laughs> i can i've still got i've always got more stuff to talk about yeah yeah go, go, go ahead while we're waiting well i think something something that's at least some people will be interested in hearing about is uh what's the deal with dinosaurs in the wild so 
for some of you will know already about this traveling exhibition, mm -hmm. this immersive time travel thing called Dinosaurs in the Wild. You you went to it and wrote a very yeah. nice article on it. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was it was based in the UK. It it, it started in um, uh, Manchester, then went to Birmingham, then finished in London. And uh, the the idea was you go back in time, you look at a time base that's been reconstructed in the Cretaceous, where people are actually studying Cretaceous life, and then you look out through these windows, which are actually not windows, actually screens, mm -hmm. and you're looking at CG animals in a landscape. And um, I was the consultant on this project. There's a few things I would have done a little bit differently if I did it now, right. but um, we basically, you know, we tried really hard to be up to date on the science, to be, you know, cutting edge in terms of how the animals are portrayed, behaviour, biology, etc. Right. And um, as you can tell from the reviews, Albert's article and other other people's articles, it, it it pretty much you know hit the mark, and people said good things about it. Mm -hmm. So where is it? What's happening to it? Right. Well, I can't say everything, mm -hmm. but I can say that um it went to another country yeah. a pretty big country where there's lots of people uh -huh. in asia uh -huh. and then events including a big political uh, uh thing right. followed by obviously the current situation right. has meant that it's still kind of in limbo as to what's right. happening okay. yeah so well, there's a danger that they'll burn up whatever money they sort of have put aside uh, well that but, um yeah, if they, yeah, if they don't, if they are able to, yeah. you know, if if it's all able to go ahead, it will be visible again in a big, well-known Eastern Asian country, Excellent. and um, in which case, you know, it'll be open to a, a whole new audience, and um, and and then if that's a success, who knows where it'll go from there? Right. Excellent. That's the, well, you know, kind of a uncertain future, but uh, good good to know uh, because. I'm sure a lot of people are wondering. Um, so uh, let's see. I think I'll keep this going for about five or six minutes because I do need time to retrieve the, the next guest. But in the meantime, we did receive a few more questions with donations. Uh, so the first question is: Have you heard about the new taper? <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a new there's a new taper. Yeah, astonishing. <laughs> no. <laughs> Darren has wow. not heard of the new taper. That is a, that's a surprise. Check, check that out. Um, Thanks. The other um, the other question is, um, let's see, a lot of cryptid sightings are delightfully vague and come with little evidence. So do you think there's room for new tantalizing cryptids in this modern age when everybody has, you know, HD video on, in their pockets? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, an interesting one. Um, it's, a, it's kind of a, an, an interestingly worded question because do you think there's room for more cryptids? That's not the same. Uh, this isn't a criticism of the question, right. but that's not the same as saying, do we think there are new big animals out there to find? Right. Because so because on that front, it's like, yeah, there's still there's still new stuff to find, but the numbers are diminishing. So mm -hmm. there's still a few like moderately large marine animals that we're going to find. And there's probably still a handful of like mammals and lizards and stuff like literally a handful that are probably still awaiting discovery yeah. probably none of them are going to you know match the cryptids of the cryptozoological literature sad sad to say as, right. as much as i really wish bigfoot were real but in terms of like are people you know finding you know are they going to announce new cryptids well yeah because cryptids are really kind of more like cultural, cultural right. yeah they're cultural events and it's like the number of uh, cryptids the number of mystery creatures that people are claiming to exist is not going down it's going up mm -hmm. so if you pay any attention to for example the north american cryptozoological community the thing that everybody talks about the big thing is dog man right <laughs> so so not only is bigfoot present east to west and north to, north to south across certainly north america and and central and south america as well right. but let's not worry about that um there's big for everywhere of all different kinds there's also now dog man all over the place and I, I i could i could talk for like ages about that i'm i'm not going to i'm just going to say that that's a new cryptid that's a new thing that's like you know become a part of popular culture and is now supposedly being seen by people right. all over the place right. and we're right. seeing more and more things like that with a, and, 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 and how much this ties into, you know, public education and so on, that's another controversial thing. But 
there are people who do honestly believe these are real animals but there's also a large number of people who are kind of like playing along and really enjoying the idea that these things are real which is encouraging like belief in them and their mm. their status as like cultural icons right. so and there's more of those things that are gonna are, are appearing and are mm. gonna continue to yeah absolutely well that sounds uh, sounds like you answered that question um okay i think the next one will probably have to be the last one but we'll see um so uh, this question says from from Wakavos, uh you mentioned that you would change some things about dinosaurs in the wild if you were to do it what would those things be yeah, top of the list is uh, fuzzy tyrannosaurs. Mm. We put we put way too much fuzz on the tyrannosaur, right. tyrann specifically tyrannosaurus. Yep. Mm. I still am of the opinion, as are most tyrannosaur workers, still of the opinion that they probably did have filaments, a thin covering of filaments across, you know, part of the body. Uh, they they would not have looked. I've got a collector tyrannosaurus here. Oh, I mean, yeah. look at that. This right. this animal reminds me of this is Rumpelstiltskin from uh, one of the Shrek films. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that, that's a no. Uh, I think we way overdid it. So th there's that. Mm -hmm. And secondly, if I could, I would totally change the environment. We went for, and I've got a talk online about dinosaurs in the wild. And while we went with this, uh, the various decisions that we did, we, yeah. we had to, for budgetary reasons, we had to go for a, a relatively arid, sunny um, part of North America with lots of space. Yes. And I really wish we'd gone for something that was far more, uh, cluttered and far more forested in keeping with the, you know, Hell Creek environment we were aiming to right. uh, show. And what final thing is as darkid takeoff. Mm. I think our, our as darkids were like, you know, a real winner, absolutely like yeah, phenomenal, performed phenomenally <laughs> well. They look great. Yeah. Thanks. Um, but the takeoff was never mastered mm. and that was just a thing that we needed to spend a couple more days on. And again, we couldn't, right. if we had a, an attempt to revise it, I would I would try and uh, work more closely with the, uh, the the animator who did that and come up with a better takeoff model. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Excellent. Well, I think uh, let's see, we we're just about out of time. We have about a, a minute left um, before I need to head off. So uh, thank you very much for joining us with this uh, event, Darren. Thank you very much. It was it was good. I've I've long been uh, I've, I've I've tried in some of my writing and tweetings and things to s support the idea that I think science and writing and everything, you know, with what what we do should be seen as like club human. It's like we right. want more and more people from diverse backgrounds contributing Absolutely. to all this stuff. It's and it's very important for the stuff I care about that these things are not seen as um, as being as white as they often are um so um yeah big supporter of uh, blm and i hope this i think i think this is a uh, really you know a valuable thing well done to everyone who's been involved and thanks to everyone who's contributed donated keep it coming yeah keep them coming and thanks yeah thanks right. for having me uh yeah that sounds a uh, sounds excellent so i'm going to um turn my uh, screen off on the stream for a bit as well as the sound